curl is a very important part of vector calculus, but it's one of those topics that, at least when I was exposed to it, is not often given a full and intuitive explanation. It is often described as the tendency of rotation in a vector field, and this definitely helps to understand the general gist of what curl is, but it always felt a bit too hand-wavy for me. Which is somewhat unfortunate, because I feel like one of the fundamental concepts of Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism deserves some more recognition and understanding. Depending on how you've learned about curl, you may have come across this definition for the 2D version. It's kind of overwhelming at first, so let's take it apart. The term on the right in this formula is called a circulation around curve C, which is kind of a measure of how aligned our vector field is with the curve when you go around in a counterclockwise direction. Don't worry, we'll talk more about what that specifically means in a minute. The divisor of this expression, r, represents the area contained by that curve c. And the limit term states that we want this expression as r tends to zero, so the curve shrinks down to a point. But no matter how small it gets, the value we want for curl is always the ratio of the circulation around c divided by the area contained by it. That's all fine and good, but if you've ever calculated the 2D curl of a field, you know that the formula is the partial derivative of g with respect to x minus the partial derivative of f with respect to y. And even worse, the formula for the curl of a 3D vector field is represented as a complicated cross product. So how do you get from our original definition to these formulas? And even still, what do these formulas intuitively mean? How do these differences of partial derivatives somehow represent rotation? By the end of this video, I hope that I'll have given you a more thorough and intuitive understanding of how curl works and how it's defined. Let's start by fully wrapping our heads around just the 2D definition in this video, but not before a quick refresher on circulations. Imagine you have some line traversing a vector field of force, and you want to know the quote-unquote work done by the field as you move along that straight line. We can call it work here, but in general the value we want is the total effect of the vector field as you go along our path. Well, if the force vectors are constant everywhere, our work just becomes the dot product of the force vector and the straight vector that describes our path. We can do this because no matter where we are on the line, the vectors are constant, so they always have the same exact effect along the path. But what happens if our force vectors are not constant? And even worse, what happens if our line is no longer a line, but a curve? How do we calculate the work then? Well, calculus tells us that if we zoom in enough, we can get a differential displacement vector, dr, that describes our path for an infinitesimally small portion of it. We can then dot that differential vector with the force vector at that point, and we get the differential work done by that tiny portion. But if we want the total work, we have to sum up all of those little bits all along the curve. And that's exactly where the integral comes in, because it represents the sum of exactly that. And a circulation is that exact same thing, but around a closed curve. Anyway, back to curl. In order to build up to this formula, I'm going to start by using our earlier definition that defined curl as sort of the circulation density of a vector field. So let's set up a situation where we can use this limit and actually try to compute it. Here we have our curve around which our circulation can take place. Obviously it's embedded in a vector field defined by f, but that can be in the background for now. Also, because the curl isn't dependent on the actual shape of the curve as it shrinks to zero, we can make it any shape we want. So let's make it a rectangle for simplicity. We can make the side lengths dx and dy, which we should think about as being infinitesimally small if we're taking this limit. We can also assign arbitrary coordinates to each corner of the rectangle based on those side lengths. This may already look a bit crowded, but it'll help with our calculation. Another important thing to note is that normally, one side of this curve would have a multitude of differently oriented vectors along its length, so actually taking that circulation would be difficult. But as we take our limit, as the curve shrinks down to infinity, the vectors along one side become more and more similar until they effectively become constant along that whole side. Because we now have a straight path combined with constant vectors, we don't even need to take any integrals. We can just label each side as its own vector, and our circulation becomes the sum of the individual dot products of each side. The rest of this process is essentially computation, 
and if you think you might know how to simplify all this, I really encourage you to try it before I show you how it turns out. But let's continue. The next thing I'm going to do is compute the dot products of the left and right sides, which comes out to this. Keep in mind that the g in here is the vertical component of the vector field, and the dy here is the length of the left and right sides of our curve. Now we can do the same thing with the top and bottom sides, where f is the horizontal component of the vector field, and dx is the length of those sides that we just computed. But even with this expression, it's still only the circulation part of curl, so we still need to divide the circulation by the area contained by our curve. Well, what's the area? It's just dx dy, because remember, those are the side lengths of our rectangle. So we can divide our circulation by that to get an expression for curl. Splitting this up into two sides, we have some cancellations. The dy's on the left cancel, along with the dx's on the right, so we can get rid of those terms. Now, hopefully these expressions might look more familiar to you, because these are the limit definitions of the partial derivatives we're looking for. The left side numerator is the difference in g values, the vertical component of the field, divided by the interval of the difference, dx. And the right side, after factoring out a negative sign, is the exact same thing. The numerator is the difference between f values, the horizontal component of the field, divided by the interval that difference is over, dy. So we can rewrite then this whole expression as our goal, the formula for 2D curl. But now that we have this formula, I do concede that this definition is a little too formal, and that derivation still lacks a basic intuition of what curl actually represents. Remember, we still haven't actually determined what these partial derivatives mean in and of themselves. We know how to derive them, but oftentimes formulas in math have an intuitive meaning that can be understood simply by looking at the final formula. So hopefully that gave you some foundation, but let's try to build some intuition now. A common way to visualize curl is to imagine a wheel in our vector field spinning in a direction corresponding to the vectors around it. Depending on where you place your wheel, it will spin with a different direction and speed given by the curl. It's important to note that the sign convention for the spinning is that counterclockwise rotation is associated with positive curl, and clockwise rotation is associated with a negative curl. Let's take a closer look at this, though. In this basic case, we have a wheel with a vector on each side of it. Since these are only vertical vectors, we can consider them as just the g component of a vector field and label them as such. These vectors are in opposite directions, which push the wheel in a counterclockwise direction. So we can consider this first scenario as having both a strong and positive curl. This next scenario is exactly the same, except our g vectors are now in the same direction. But since the vector on the right is greater than the one on the left, it still rotates in a counterclockwise direction. But since the vector on the left is kind of pushing back against the right one, it doesn't rotate quite as fast. So this scenario would still have a positive curl, but not as great as the first one. In the final scenario, our vectors on either side are exactly the same. So doesn't it make sense that this wheel shouldn't rotate at all? That's exactly right. The curl here from these vectors would be zero. So, looking at all these scenarios, the first one has the strongest curl, the second one has less, but still positive, and the third one has zero curl. So, what's changing between these scenarios? If you think about it, the only thing that isn't constant is how different the vectors on either side of the wheel are. To put it more formally, the only thing changing is the difference between the g vectors, delta g, along the interval of however wide the wheel is, delta x. And as we take this expression to the infinitesimal limit, it just turns into the partial derivative of g with respect to x. Wouldn't you agree that as this difference gets bigger, the counterclockwise rotation would also increase? But this only gives us half the story. What about the horizontal component? Turns out we can do almost the exact same process. In this scenario, we have our two vectors on the top and bottom of the wheel. And since they are just horizontal vectors, we can consider them as the f component of a vector field. These vectors are still pulling the wheel in a counterclockwise direction, so it still has positive curl. So we can still try to represent our metric as the partial derivative, the difference in the f vectors over the interval they are separated by, dy. But there's a small problem, because as we go from negative to positive in our y direction, the f factor actually goes from positive to negative, 
Because of this, the metric we want is actually the negative partial derivative. So now we have our second component describing rotation, but since they are both contributing to the exact same measurement, we can just add them together to get a complete picture of rotation. So I hope that you now have a pretty good intuitive understanding of what 2D curl is. Sometime in the future I'll make a follow up video giving some hopefully new intuition for 3D curl, but hopefully you might start to see how that might work already. Thanks for watching.